this lesson, we will introduce a very important set of groups called the symmetric groups, whose elements consist of one-to-one -one and onto functions. First, let's define a permutation. So given a set S, then a permutation of S is a bijection that is a one-to-one -one onto function from S to itself. So we're going to look at the particular set consisting of the integers one through n. So if our set S contains integers one, two, three, up to an integer n, then the set of all permutations of S actually forms a group. And since the permutations are functions, the operation for this group is function composition. Okay, so let's note the composition by normal notation. And this group is called the symmetric group of degree n. And again, in this particular case, when we're permuting the integers one through n, we actually denote the symmetric group of degree n by S sub n. So let's verify that S n is actually a group. So since the composition of two bijections is also a bijection, we see that SN is closed under composition. So SN is closed under the group operation Let's verify the three conditions of a group. Well, in general, compositions of functions is associative. So in particular, when the functions are bijections, composition is still associative. 
Secondly, there is an identity permutation of Sn, namely the permutation that takes every integer in the set S and maps it to itself. So the identity permutation of Sn is the permutation will denote it by one defined by one of x equals x for any integer x in the set s. So this is our identity permutation. It maps every integer to itself. And thirdly, let's discuss inverses. Every one-to-one -one and onto function also has a unique inverse function. So every bijection has a bijective inverse. So given a permutation in Sn, for example, let's use sigma as a permutation, has an inverse, sigma inverse in Sn satisfying sigma composed with sigma inverse equals sigma inverse composed with sigma which is equal to the identity permutation thus the set sn under composition is a group Now let's describe the elements of Sn. So every permutation in Sn can be described by listing the elements one through n and their images. So we're going to take every element of the set S, the integers one through N, and write them on a line. So we're gonna start by listing the numbers one through N. on a line and then below each number we're going to list the image of that number under the permutation So let's look at an example. So in S3, 
we have the integers 1, 2, and 3 being permuted by bijections. So you could have the identity permutation. So we have a list of numbers 1, 2, and 3. And then the images, well, 1 gets sent to 1, 2 gets sent to 2, and 3 gets sent to 3. So this is one way to write the identity permutation. Well, then we could also have, there's five more permutations in S3. One could get fixed to one, two could be permuted to three, and three could be permuted to two. One could get sent to two, two could get sent to one, and three could get sent to three. One could get sent to two, two could get sent to three, three could get sent to one. One could get mapped to three, two could get sent to one, and three could get sent to two. And then the last permutation sends one to three, two gets sent to itself, and three gets sent to one. So these are the six possible permutations in S3. So S3 will be the set containing these six bijections. So when we look at this set, the operation composition is the standard function composition. So for example, the composition Sigma followed by tau is the permutation tau followed by sigma. So just like regular function composition, you actually read it from right to left when you apply the operation to a set. For a specific example, Let sigma be the permutation that maps 1 to 3, 2 to 2, and 3 to 1. And let's let tau be the permutation in S3 that maps 1 to 2, 2 to 1, and 3 to 3. Then the composition of sigma and tau would be this composition and so let's let's write this as an element of s three tau maps one to two and then sigma maps two to two. So one is getting mapped to the element two under this composition. Similarly, if we look at two, tau maps two to one, and then one is getting sent to three by sigma. So in the composition, two gets mapped to three, and then three is getting mapped to one. Let's look at the composition tau composed with sigma. So now, starting on the right, one is getting mapped to three, and then three is getting mapped to three. So in the composition, one is being sent to three. 2 is being mapped to 2 by sigma, and then 2 is getting mapped to 1 by tau. So the composition maps 2 to 1, and then 3 gets mapped to 1 by sigma, and then 1 gets mapped to 2 by tau. 
So the image of three is two in the composition. Now notice that the composition of sigma and tau is not equal to the composition of tau and sigma. So this shows that S3 is not a billion. And in fact, this same example actually shows that Sn is not a billion for any n greater than or equal to three. So for any n greater than three, you could use the same transformation sigma and tau where all the integers bigger than three are just mapped to themselves. And so this, this example shows that Sn is not abelian for n greater than or equal to three. Now we'll prove a theorem about the order of Sn. that is exactly n factorial bijections from a set of n elements to itself. So if the proof, let's look at the number of possible bijections on a set with n elements. If you're given a permutation in Sn, if sigma is a permutation, then sigma permutes the numbers one through n. So if we consider the image of one, sigma of the number one can equal any of n elements in the set one through n. So for any bijection, you have n choices for setting up sigma of one. Then when you're building a, a bijection, you need to choose an image for sigma of two. Well, sigma of two can equal any of the other n minus one elements other than sigma of one. So sigma of two can equal any of the n minus one elements of S other than sigma of one. So we have n choices for sigma of one, then we have n minus one choices for the image of two under sigma. Then continuing this way, we see that there are n minus two choices for the image of three. and so on until we've built a bijection sigma that permutes all the integers one through n. So continuing this way, we see that therefore there are n choices for sigma of one times n minus one choices for 
sigma of two times n minus two choices for sigma of three, and so on, all the way down to two choices for n minus, sigma of n minus one. And finally, there's only one choice left for sigma of n, once you've determined the previous n minus one images. And so we see that there's n factorial possible permutations of S. And these per permutations are exactly the elements of Sn. Now we will describe a more convenient notation for the permutations of Sn, and this notation is called cycle notation. A cycle will be a string of integers which represents an element of Sn. So for example, in S3, let's look at the permutation sigma. Which maps 1 to 2, 2 to 3, and 3 to 1. Let's write this in cycle notation. So here's the notation. We start with the smallest integer that's being permuted. So one, and we see that one is being sent to two. And then we take the image and two, we see that two is being sent to three. So the cycle notation would be one, then two, and three. The idea of this cycle is that one is being sent to two, two is then being sent to three, and then cyclically three is being sent to one. So this means Sigma sends one to two, two to three, and three back to one. Now there's actually more than one way to write a permutation in cycle notation. For example, we could also write sigma as 2, 3, 1, or 3, 1, 2. So we see that the cycle notation is not unique, but it is standard to write the smallest integer in a cycle first. So we'll try to stick to this convention.
Let's look at a slightly more complicated example of cycle notation. So consider the following permutation in S sub 13. Defined by, so now we're going to be permuting the integers 1 through 13. So 1 is mapped to 12, 2 is mapped to 13, 3 is mapped to 3, 4 is mapped to 1, 5 is mapped to 11. Let me just continue filling this out. Okay, so we have this element of S13. We're going to give what we call the cycle decomposition of sigma. So we're going to write sigma in cycle notation. And as we'll see, we'll actually have to use more than one cycle to describe sigma. So this product of disjoint cycles makes up the cycle decomposition of sigma. The cycles are disjoint if they have no numbers in common. So let's begin with the cycle involving the integer 1. We see that 1 is being sent to 12, then 12 is being sent to 8, then 8 is being sent to 10, and 10 is being sent to 4, which then we see is mapped to 1. So that closes this cycle, and we then continue the next cycle with the first integer, the smallest integer that hasn't shown up yet, so the integer 2 starts a new cycle in this product. We see that 2 is mapped to the integer 13. And then 13 is mapped to 2. That closes this second cycle in this decomposition. The number 3 is the smallest integer that hasn't shown up yet. But notice that 3 is mapped to itself. So this cycle only has one integer in it. Then we need to start a cycle with the integer 5. 5 is mapped to 11. 11 is mapped to 7. And then 7 is mapped to 5. So that closes this cycle. And finally, the integer 6 is mapped to 9. And 9 is mapped to 6. So this is the final cycle of the cycle decomposition. So this product of cycles completely describes the permutation sigma. For some notation, notice the first cycle has length 5. So we call this a 5 cycle. Okay, so it has length 5. In other words, it has 5 integers in the cycle. So the next cycle has two integers in it, has length two. We call that a two cycle, often called a transposition, because it just exchanges two integers. Uh, three would be, the, the third cycle is a one cycle, three cycle is next, and then another transposition or two cycle. And I used the word disjoint already. We define two cycles with no numbers in common to be disjoint. So two cycles with no numbers in common. are 
called disjoint. So the cycle decomposition of a permutation is a product of disjoint cycles that describe the permutation. So by following the steps of the previous example for any permutation, we have the following fact. Every permutation can be written as the product of disjoint cycles. And as we saw before, a cycle can be written in more than one way, but if we exclude different ways to write each cycle, you can actually write this product of disjoint cycles uniquely up to the order of the factors of the cycles and excluding different ways of writing the same cycle. If we look back at the previous example, we saw that we had a one cycle involving the integer three. The permutation sigma maps three to three So in the previous example, sigma of three equals three, and therefore the, the one cycle containing just the integer three appeared in the cycle decomposition. Well, it's actually standard when writing a cycle decomposition to remove all the one cycles. So if you're looking at a particular permutation and cycle notation, if you don't see an, an integer, it's understood that it's being mapped to itself. So it's standard to remove all one cycles from a decomposition. So if an integer is missing, It's understood to be mapped to itself. So let's go back to the set of permutations of the integers one, two, and three, S3, let's write the elements of S3 in cycle notation. So we'll denote the identity as just the integer one. And then we saw that you could have permutations that fix one to itself and then permute two and three. So that would be the cycle two, three then three could be fixed and one could be sent to two. Or we could have two being fixed and one being mapped to three. So there's three possible two cycles and then there's actually two three cycles. One could get mapped to two and then two gets mapped to three. Or one could get mapped to three and then three get mapped to two. 
So these are the standard ways to write the permutations in S3 in cycle no notation. Now let's talk about the inverse of a permutation. So for any permutation in SN, so any permutation sigma in SN, we can actually write the cycle decomposition for the inverse of sigma by simply writing the numbers of each cycle of sigma in reverse order. So for example, if sigma maps one to two, then the inverse function, sigma inverse, would map two to one. If you wrote each cycle of sigma in reverse order, this would result in the cycle decomposition for sigma inverse. So an example, if sigma is the permutation that maps one to three and three to four and then maps four back to one and then permutes two and five. So this would be an element of S5, for example. So a permutation of the integers one through five. Then the inverse of sigma would map four to three and then three to one and then it would map five to two. Now let's discuss an important fact about cycles. If you have disjoint cycles So when we call disjoint cycles are cycles that contain no numbers in common, we can actually commute two disjoint cycles. So in general, we saw that Sn is non-abelian. Therefore, you can't, in general, commute two permutations. But if you have two cycles, that contain no integers in common, you can commute these cycles. Why would this be true? Well, think about it. If, if sigma and tau are disjoint cycles, in Sn, then sigma permutes some integers from one to n, but tau permutes different integers from sigma. So sigma and tau permute numbers in disjoint subsets of the integers one through n, so if you rearrange the permutation sigma and tau, the net result will be the same. So sigma composed with tau is actually the same permutation as 
the composition of tau and sigma. So let's begin talking about the order of a permutation by looking at powers of cycles. Let's look at an example. So consider the permutation sigma defined by the cycle one, two, three, four, five, six, and S six. Let's consider the composition of sigma with itself. So sigma squared will be the same as sigma composed with itself. So if I write two copies of sigma next to each other. Let's look at the composition. One is being sent to two, and then two is being sent to three by the by sigma on the left. So one is being mapped to three. Then three is getting sent to four, and then four is getting sent to five. So we see that three gets mapped to five. Then continuing this way, five gets mapped to six, and then six gets mapped to one. So in sigma squared, we have a three cycle, one, three, five. Then starting with another cycle with two, two is getting sent to three, three gets sent to four, four gets sent to five, and five gets sent to six, six gets mapped to one, one gets mapped to two, so we have another three cycle, two, four, six. So look at the net result. If we look at the original permutation sigma, when we, when we compose sigma with itself, sigma squared is just like taking two steps in the original permutation. So for example, if I take two steps, one is being sent to three, and then three is getting sent to five, and then five is getting sent back to one in under sigma squared. Similarly, two is getting sent to four, four is getting sent to six, and six is getting sent to two. So to look at the cycle decomposition of sigma squared, you can just take two steps in cycle notation of sigma. So let's look at sigma cubed. So that is sigma composed with itself three times. Well, by similar reasoning, we can just take three steps in the cycle decomposition of sigma. So if we start with one, if we take three steps, one is being sent to four, four is getting sent back to one, so that's a two cycle. Two is getting sent to five, and then five is getting sent back to two. So we have a two cycle, two, five. And then finally we have, if we start with three, and I take three steps, three is getting mapped to six, and then three steps later, six is getting sent to three. So this would be the cycle decomposition for sigma cubed. So we just take three steps in sigma. So we can continue, let's look at sigma to the fourth power. So again, you would take four steps in the cycle decomposition of sigma. So one is getting sent to five, five is getting sent to three, and then three is getting sent to one. So that closes that cycle. Two is getting sent to six after four steps. 
6 is getting sent to 4, and then 4 is getting sent back to 2. So that closes that cycle. Sigma to the fifth power. Now you take five steps. So one is getting sent to six. Six sent to five. Five is sent to four. Four sent to three. And three is sent to two. Finally, let's look at sigma to the sixth power. Well, if since sigma it has length six if you take six steps every integer will be sent to itself so we see that sigma to the sixth power is actually the identity permutation so the order of permutation sigma is therefore six because sigma to the sixth power is the identity and no smaller power of sigma equals the identity. This leads to the following important fact. Following the same reasoning as the previous example, we see that the order of an n cycle that is a cycle of length n is n so if you have an arbitrary n cycle with integers a1 a2 a3 up to a n we see that if you if you compose this permutation with itself n times, a1 is getting sent to a2, enter one step. If I take two steps, it goes to a3, and then take n minus one steps, it's, it's a n, and then a n will be sent back to a1 in the nth step. And so we see that the order of the n cycle has to be n. So now we know that the order of an n cycle is n. So for a particular permutation of Sn, this permutation might have several cycles in its cycle decomposition. So how can you find the order of a permutation which is a product of many cycles? Well, the next theorem nails it down for us. The order of a permutation is actually equal to the least common multiple of the lengths of the cycles in its cycle decomposition. So to begin the proof, first notice, as we just stated, that an n cycle has order n. So if a permutation only has one n cycle in its decomposition, then 
the order of that permutation is n. Now let's look at a permutation that is the product of two disjoint cycles. So next, suppose sigma and tau are disjoint cycles. of length m and n respectively and let's let k be equal to the least common multiple of m and n So what we're going to show is that the product of sigma and tau must have order k. So since sigma has length m and tau has length n, we see that sigma to the power m is the identity and tau to the power n is the identity. But we also know that disjoint cycles commute we can conclude that sigma composed with tau to the power k is the same as sigma to the power k times tau to the power k. But since k is a multiple of m, sigma to the k is also equal to the identity. And since k is a multiple of n, tau to the k will be the, equal to the identity. And so we have the fact that the product sigma tau to the power k is the identity. So we now know that the order of sigma tau has to be less than or equal to k because the order of a permutation would be the smallest integer power that is equal to the identity. So we know that the order of sigma tau must be less than or equal to k. Now we're going to show that the order of sigma tau can't be less than k and therefore it has to equal k. So suppose I have a positive integer that's less than k let's call it j. So suppose I have an integer j that's between 0 and k Let's look at the product sigma tau to the power j. Well, again, since disjoint cycles commute, we can write this as sigma to the power j times tau to the power j and the idea is that this cannot equal the identity permutation. Why not? Well, remember k is the least common multiple of m and n. Since j is less than k, j cannot be a multiple of both m and n. So sigma tau to the power of j can't equal the identity because sigma to the power j is not equal to the identity or tau to the j does not equal the identity since j is not a multiple of m or not a multiple of n.
So if j is not a multiple of m, then sigma to the j is not the identity. And similarly, tau to the j might not be equal to the identity. So we see that sigma tau to the power k is the identity, but sigma tau to the power j does not equal the identity for any j between 0 and k. Therefore, the order of sigma tau can't be less than k. And thus, the order of sigma tau must be equal to k, which is, again, the least common multiple of m and n. So if a permutation is given by an n cycle, then the order is n. If you have the product of two disjoint cycles of length m and n, then the order of the product is the least common multiple of m and n. Now, the general case involving more than two cycles can be proven inductively. So we're not going to show that, but the idea is similar to the proof we just gave for the case of two disjoint cycles. So the general case involving more than two cycles can be proven inductively. So this finishes the proof of this theorem.